Dr. Christopher Bunt beside me is with Biotactic. He's a fish and wildlife researcher who has some interesting perspectives on fish and wildlife. Welcome. Thank you. Now, I was reading your paper here, good academic paper from 2011, which means the research was probably a little bit before that because it takes time to publish. But am I correct in summarizing your research in saying that we don't know enough about fish and why they behave the way they do and what sort of a fish way they like and so on. Is that about a, a, a decent summary of your research? Yeah, that's certainly what the results of the meta-analysis that we conducted revealed. My question is, why is that? Because we've had fishways and dams for a thousand years or so. We've built a great number of them. And what you're basically saying is we weren't entirely sure what to build or whether it would work, but we kept building. Well, the, the conclusions of the results were primarily um, based on the, the limited number of studies that have actually been done with a variety of species and a variety of fishway designs in a variety of different locations. So uh, certain claims that were being made about the efficacy of certain fishways were based on anecdotal information or they weren't based, they just weren't based on enough scientific study and enough um, studies that were uh, of fishways that were designed with a monitoring program in place as well so that these fishway designs could be effectively um, evaluated and then compared. So with that, with that study, there were, there were, there were, even though there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of data, they came from a very limited number of studies across the whole spectrum of different types of fishway designs and species that use those types of fishways. Well, let me see if I can continue summarizing your scientific research uh, somewhat adequately. Um, you said words to the effect that fish may go up to a passageway, which could be a ladder or, you know, a, a weir and pool uh, thing, something that encourages fish to get up over and around a dam. So w we know they went up there, but we don't know whether they went in. And if they didn't go in, we didn't know whether it was because they didn't like the structure or they didn't like the temperature of the water. I is that about right? Yeah, well, I mean, there are, there, there are many complexities when it comes to um, successful, successful fish passage. The fish initially need to be guided to where the structure is located. Then they need to be able to enter the structure. Um, and then there, I mean, there are certain behavioral and physiological factors that f f fall into play about whether or not they're going to successfully enter a structure. And then they need to be able to swim successfully from the entrance of the structure downstream from the dam to the top of the structure and the exit. So there are all different factors that go into play. Uh, water velocity, turbidity, uh, turbulence, um, the, uh, the types of com complexity within the fishway itself that um, reduces water velocities or provides refugia for uh, certain, under certain conditions, depending on the locations within the fishway that fish might be swimming. So fish have to, there's three, at least three different main variables that we look at when we're trying to evaluate the effectiveness of a fishway. And that's whether they're able to find the fishway itself, whether they're able to enter the fishway, and whether they're able to swim all the way to the top of it. And so we try to um, evaluate, we try to assign certain metrics to these different factors. And we measure certain things such as uh, guidance efficiency, attraction efficiency and passage efficiency and all of those variables plus several others contribute to whether or not a fishway is going to be considered successful for passing species A, B, C, ideally the entire fish community. That's our, our, you know, our objective typically is to, with fish passage research, is to make a dam as porous as possible or as transparent as possible for both upstream, upstream and downstream migrating fish. Now, now, there's a great old expression that um, an academic would uh, rather use another academic's toothbrush rather than his or her jargon. But in terms of the uh, terminology you just used, fish passageway, um, I've spoken to European researchers who says they don't say they don't like that term because it implies the fish can pass. And maybe that is in doubt. So they use the term fishway or, or other terms. Do you have a good guess as to what percentage of fish can actually use these constructed structures? Sure, well, a good guess based on the, uh, again, a, a rather limited number of studies done globally. 
um, would put the uh, a pa typical passage range between approximately 30 and 50 percent. Okay, so 30 and 50, between 30 and 50 percent of the fish, depending on the species, that means up to 50 to uh, 70 percent of the fish either um, starve, uh, die, don't uh, spawn, uh, get injured as they are, you know, pushed together, or have some other fate. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, for sure. Um, and I mean, there have been some really interesting studies that have been done with uh, dam removal studies. Um, um, we're actually working on one at the moment in, in, in Saugeen River, where we've removed a dam and subsequently and inadvertently increased fish passage at the, da at the dams upstream from where this dam was removed as a consequence of the fish arriving at these upstream dams in better condition. They haven't spent days and days and days trying to pass uh, the, the dam um, that was removed. Um, they're not injuring themselves over and over and over again, trying to leap over, the, over this structure. Um, of course, in certain situations, as you suggested, the fish are relegated to suboptimal spawning areas downstream, um, or they'll resorb their gametes, they won't spawn. Um, or they just become so injured or so um, exhausted that they'll, in the case of migratory rainbow trout, for example, they might just swim back out to the lake for the year. And so, in, in general conversation with me uh, in the green room, as we say in television, before we started recording, you said that uh, something startling to me. From watching nature documentaries, I would have thought fish love to leap up over dams and that's just kind of what they do but you pointed out sometimes they're leaping up and hitting their heads repeatedly on the dam and and injuring themselves yeah that's that's exactly right yeah especially with leaping species but not not all species that you use fishways or not all species that are considered to be migratory strongly highly migratory um are are, are species that leap there are highly migratory non-leaping fish species that um, need to be able to um, be accommodated by different types of fish ladders that don't, for example, produce a series of pools that fish have to leap into, like the traditional fish ladder design. So, you know, that sort of where is where the, there was the initial differentiation between a fish ladder and a fish way. A fish way was generally a corridor with certain types of roughness elements installed in it at, ang at specific angles, designed all to reduce the velocity in a primary flow of water the fish swim through in order to progress upstream. But some of the other more effective fishways are, are nature-like designs, and they, they mimic nature. They mimic natural structures, so they're made with rocks and boulders, and there are meanders, and pools of differing sizes, and um, areas where there might be um, ba certain backwater areas, a differences, in a differences in turbulence, a lot of variation in flow that non-leaping species in particular are able to negotiate uh, much more effectively. So, for example, with, with rainbow trout, they're a highly migratory, very, very strongly motivated species that typically don't, didn't really have much of an issue with passage once they were able to locate a fishway. Um, but in, uh, for example, some of the stuff that's been done in Ontario with steelhead or rainbow trout migration, once they are able to locate a nature-like fishway, their passage is, a, is typically 100%. So it's, we've gone from these sort of technical designs with early fish passage and early fish ladders to trying to mimic natural types of streams. Um, the problem is that they take up a lot of space. Um, they can't be built compactly. Uh, and they, are, they take up a long, I mean, the, the largest, one of the largest fishways in the world is in South America, and it's 10 kilometers long. So, I mean, you've got to have an awful lot of space to be able to accommodate um, um, fish passage, it's on a very narrow slope, which is what nature-like types of fishways are typically built on. Now, there seems to be another uh, implication of these uh, 50 to 70 percent of the fish that can't make it up a fishway, and that is uh, their growth is stunted generation by generation. I've seen pictures of uh, cod, maybe three feet long. I jigged a cod uh, two feet long on my honeymoon in Newfoundland years ago. They may not exist in that size anymore. Sturgeon can be six, eight feet tall, taller than a human being and, and weigh a thousand pounds. Is the smaller size a result of inadequate fish ways? Uh, well, smaller sizes of fish stocks is typically a result of over-exploitation. 
Um, and so when a population becomes overexploited, it's usually the larger fish that are removed from the population first. Um, there are certain characteristics uh, related to fish size that affect their uh, abilities to use fishways effectively. So certain fishways, for example, um, some, some, some technical fishways pass smaller, smaller fish better than they pass larger fish. As a result of certain things, like you can imagine, there's, there's differential drag as a result of cross-sectional area. So a smaller fish um, can exploit areas, for example, along the bottom of the fishway where the, or a fish ladder where the flows are reduced. We call that a benthic boundary layer. And smaller fish are able to exploit those areas better than larger fish within the same species, even. So, there, I mean, there is potentially some size selection that, uh, that occurs with fish passage, um, but in terms of uh, size selection um, uh, based on uh, just a, through, like filtering through a fish ladder affecting a population, I don't believe there have been very many studies that have been done on that. Mostly the work um, that, uh, that's been done looking at why populations of, of fish tend to be decreasing in size as a result of, as I mentioned, um, over-exploitation. Now, there's a bit of a mystery, and I'm on a bit of a detective story exploration here, and it is about sturgeon. Apparently, sturgeon are almost extinct in Europe, and I guess it's a combination of the things you talk about, overfishing and no passageways and what have you. Um, the caviar in Russia, I was shocked to find when I went there that black caviar is illegal, and I guess it's because of the diminution of the sturgeon population. Same thing in, in, in North America. I can't find anybody who knows what kind of a rapids or fishway sturgeon can get up. Uh, do you know? No. <laughs> they, we know that they have, we, they have great, a great deal of difficulty being passed through any of the fish ladders that really have, have been studied. studied. Um, the, the, again, um, th there haven't been, this is the whole thing. I mean, there, ha there haven't been uh, nature-like fishways studied in areas where sturgeon could be able to use them. So the, it's not to say that, uh, that there aren't fishway designs that could effectively accommodate sturgeon. It's, again, it comes back to the fact that there, just haven't, there hasn't been enough work. There haven't been enough monitoring studies um, across um, different fishway designs and across the range, taxonomic range. But typically, um, sturgeon are among one of the most difficult species to pass through a fishway, as are walleye. But now a sturgeon can go, can pass through an open river if that's the sturgeon's natural habitat, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Absolutely, and they can pass up through rapids. Given the fact that some of the uh, dams, in many of the dams in North America are 100 years old, and nobody was there, there was no photography, uh, we don't know for sure, we have folklore, I suppose. We don't really know what sort of an open river sturgeon can get up then, do we? Well, I mean, it's based on just historical data and based on, I mean, there are, there are telemetry studies that have been done, tracking studies that have been done on with lake sturgeon in the Great Lakes or with, uh, with white sturgeon and other species. Um, uh, but uh, so there's a fair bit of information available about um, their migratory propensity, um, how far they can move, under what conditions they can move. There's certainly studies that have been done to evaluate their swimming performance and their swimming abilities. Uh, but sturgeon are there. It's, it's very, very, very difficult to predict the behavior of fish uh, and certainly difficult to, uh, pr difficult to predict the behavior of fish under our artificial flow conditions. And we, we do know they're big and they're strong and they can leap into the air to consume some air, perhaps for buoyancy. And there is folklore that uh, if you hook onto one in the olden days, it could drag your canoe uh, the length of a football field before it uh, runs out of steam. Is that mm -hmm. what you know? Yeah, I mean, they used to be, they used to be, they used to be a big and they used to be abundant. Um, I'm standing right beside the Grand River here in Kitchener, Ontario. And there are stories that go back to um, the missionary days back in the 1600s, and apparently there were sturgeon in the river right behind, right here. So they were all throughout the Great Lakes, and they would have been swimming from Lake Erie up uh, as far as they could probably get in the Grand River, which would probably be somewhere up around Alora. All right, Christopher Bunt, uh, and I will refer to you as uh, Dr. Christopher Bunt. Uh, there are people who disagree with you. There are people who have published after 2011, who say, well, wait a minute, we know 
whether fish use a passageway, we've got RFID tags, we have remote sensing, we have all kinds of gizmos uh, to, to determine this. I'm sure you've kept up on the literature. Uh, what's new? Yeah, well, it's still, I mean, it, boy, it's, it comes back to the same, the same conclusions as before. There still haven't been enough studies to confidently say that we can pass any species of fish over any dam of any size anywhere in the world. Wow. Now, I, I could guess why, among the reasons, why bother studying fish? Uh, they were plentiful in North America until recently. The old, you know, thing we learned in school that the cod slowed down the ships as they uh, approached Newfoundland. Or, or maybe just hubris, male ego. Uh, we will build something, they will come, and that will uh, mitigate uh, the dam that we want to construct. To what do you attribute the lack of study? Um, it's been the lack of time. These studies, they take a long time. The gizmos that we use are expensive uh, to do the work effectively. What people are focusing most on uh, when it comes to restoration of fish passage, rather than building new fishways, it's removing dams. And that really is the ultimate fish passage restoration tool. Um, and it's, it's gaining momentum more and more. And um, in terms of fish passage objectives, fish passage opportunities, I really believe that's the way to go. There are the vast majority of dams that are blocking fish movement um, are unnecessary. They're historic dams. Um, the cost of removing the dam is typically much less than maintaining the dam. And it's uh, a lot of the dams that exist worldwide, especially in North America, are, are just historic dams and people are just comfortable with them in place. And again, you know, people don't like change, but when it happens, they adapt quickly and the fish adapt even quicker. Wow. And you say it's a trend and it is the right approach. I've just heard 5,000 dams have been removed in Europe, 2,000 in North America, and a couple of thousand are probably unsafe, unregulated, and just a bit upstream from a population center. And that is a huge danger for either minuscule uh, electrical power generation or none because the dam was closed down dozens of years ago. Yes. All right. Um, what's next for you? Uh, give me a little advertisement for your next uh, research, your next publication. <laughs> oh, well, um, we've got a couple of publications in, in the pipeline at the moment, um, several of which uh, relate to fish passage. Uh, some of them are related to some of the more interesting uh, facets of, of fish homing that we're looking at and abilities of fish to return to natal areas, uh, the responses of fish to changes in water levels and reservoirs and their abilities to um, navigate back to the same areas that they use seasonally. Um, and again, um, studies looking at uh, rainbow trout and whether or not they really do in the Great Lakes return to the same areas year and year again um, to spawn because we've got data that indicates an awful lot of straying and some of our Canadian fish um, tend to be enjoying a lot of time in America at the moment. So mm -hmm. we're trying to really look at some of the wider ranging um, movement patterns of these fish um, and whether they're using multiple rivers, multiple fishways, multiple times each year, that sort of thing. Some of the bigger picture um, facets again of fish passage research. Well, thanks for your time. I know the first couple of times I tried to uh, speak with you, you literally said, I've gone fishing, <laughs> which is what you do for your research. So uh, I'm glad you haven't, but if next time I try, you have gone fishing, I will understand. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.